a hole in the Mon County Commission Chambers at 243 High Street on the second floor of Morgantown, West Virginia, 26505, Tuesday, March 26th, 2024 at 7 p.m. to order. Uh, City Clerk, since you are here today, would you mind calling roll? Sure. Deputy Mayor Bubon. Present. Bill Kowecki. Here. Weezy Michael. Here. Danielle Trumbull. Here. Dave Harshbarker. Here. Brian Butcher. Here. All right. Thank you. Okay. The committee of the whole meeting of the Morgantown City Council is intended to provide an opportunity <coughs> for us, the council, to receive information, ask questions, as well as identify policy options in an informal setting. No official action will be taken at these meetings at this committee of the whole. The first matter that we are scheduled to hear today is a presentation from our City Works launch with Marvin Davis. <coughs> I just put a shade that guy. Right Um, so thank you all, City Council. Um, it's been a few months since I've uh, last spoken with you, but uh, good news is I'm coming with good news this time instead of just uh, talking about how great GIS is. Um, so um, if you've been aware, the last two years we've been in the middle of a major implementation. I've been calling it a digital transformation of our uh, permitting, licensing, uh, and our registrations. And I'm here to give you a little bit of a presentation on that today. So uh, just to give you the rundown, uh, since I only have 10 minutes, uh, what is CityWorks PLL? It is a digital online permitting and licensing platform. This will enable citizens to be able to apply, pay fees, track progress, and communicate with city staff all through a web-based uh, portal. And just to give you a count of the current application types <laughs> in the system, we got up to 49 different applications in this system and uh, the bulk of them being uh, residential and commercial construction permits um, with uh, various uh, other ones like our planning and zoning permits, engineering permits, and our uh, municipal business license. So um, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of everything, but I wanted to give one highlight to a major change that we're uh, implementing with this. Um, anybody that's familiar with our building permit process, we have one plan review form and one building permit form that encompassed a wide range of different types of projects. What we're transitioning to is a form-based uh, system where the scope of work is a little more uh, constrained but also gives a little more freedom to um, the applicant to be able to answer only specific questions to a particular type of project. You're not going to answer the depth of a swimming pool on an accessory structure or a fence. Like It's going to be specific questions relating to that particular type of work. and um, the big thing is they're divided by commercial and residential types of construction because commercial construction more often than not has a little more of a uh, due process from an inspection standpoint and a review standpoint involving more departments so that's uh, more or less why they're <coughs> broken down in that fashion. So just to give you kind of a glimpse uh, this is just a static picture uh, the next few slides are videos but uh, this is the homepage dashboard, if you will, of the public access site for CityWorks. Um, this will be what the applicant sees once they log in to our portal. And uh, if they do have any active cases, which could be a permit, a business license, or a re uh, registration for vacant or um, rental property, they will see it on this dashboard, either looking at the cards with all the uh, relevant information about it, or they can look at it with a handy dandy map at the bottom. And so just to show you kind of a look at a case, I'm just going to scroll down on the window, giving you different types of views, a map of it, any fees that are related to it, questions that have been answered, uh, any applicants or people, contacts that are added to this, any contractors that are added to this as well, all available for you to review. And what you're seeing here is essentially what uh, city staff will see when they receive your application they'll be able to review all this information from one window 
And just to give you kind of an example of one really cool feature about this, I'm playing the staff person on the back office side, putting a comment into this case, basically asking the applicant, can you provide updated dimensions for an accessory structure? And I uh, check a little box, click save, it adds that comment to the case. And uh, with the next slide, it will show me as the applicant going in and viewing that exact same comment which you see there, and I know it's hard to read with the screen, but <coughs> I'm hovering my mouse over it, and then I am an, an applicant and replying back to that staff comment, being able to provide that information back real time. It, as soon as I hit save, it will put that information back in, and the back office gets it. And I know I typed a little slow there, but once I save it, boom, it's right there on the comment thread. And that's just one cool feature. There's a lot of other ones, uh, primarily the ability to pay your fees from here. You don't have to come down to City Hall to do it. Uh, but primarily the, um, the big bulk of this is the transparency. You see what status your permit stays at, what you need to be able to provide to get your permit moving. If there's a document that you need or an answer to a question that wasn't uh, completed, that way the city staff have full transparency, being able to provide the applicant the most streamlined way of being able to uh, get their permit done in the timeliest of fashions. So just to give you uh, the little bit of a demo, now I've got to give you some important dates ahead. Uh, the month of April is going to be busy for us. Um, the first two weeks of April from the 2nd through the 11th, city staff will be training on this software, both the public front and the uh, back office side. Um, from multiple different days, different types of trainings. Uh, city staff will be in and out, but the key of this is no department will be closed during this time. We have uh, assigned staff to be able to continue operations, so there will be people available at City Hall um, on these days regardless, but please anticipate a little bit of delays on uh, some uh, business. On April 11th, this is just a key for everybody to be aware of our old system that we utilize for our business licenses and our building permits currently. The end of business on April 11th is our target date to take in the final uh, information into that system because what we're planning on doing is what's called a migration of information in the old system into CityWorks. And for that to happen, we had to hit a cutoff date and the date will be a, uh, end of day on the 11th. Um, the following week, the 15th through the 18th, has been what we've quote unquote blackout week. And this is intended to be kind of our in between week between our launch and stopping uh, using the old system to be able to input uh, any final uh, changes, but also migrate that information over and being able to do all that from uh, <laughs> hopefully within those uh, four days. But um, the other key I want to mention as well business will continue just please anticipate delays. So if you do have a form that uh, you filled out and you wanted to bring it in that week, you still can bring it in. Just please anticipate delays. And then finally, April 23rd, the big day on a Tuesday, obviously, uh, because we didn't want to start on a Monday and ruin everybody's week. Um, the official launch of public access and ac accepting of applications. So on Tuesday, April 23rd, uh, we will start promoting access for the citizen to be able to sign up create their account. If they have an existing permit and they have given the correct information, uh, once they create their account, they should be able to access any information that they have uh, already in the system. But beyond that, you're welcome to start applying for whatever uh, type of case that you need in there. And I believe, last one, what do I need to do? One thing we're definitely asking is patience. Please anticipate potential delays. Don't. Um, don't let uh, a few little headaches uh, ruin the experience. Obviously, we're trying our best to make sure things continue on as usual, but um, the key of this is this system is meant for us to improve our business practices and be able to assist citizens in a more timely and streamlined fashion. Um, so please uh, just anticipate those delays. Uh, be sure to watch our social media. Uh, earlier communication staff already put out a post uh, regarding this launch uh, and uh, more will be coming. And then if you want a preview, feel free to contact City Hall. Um, I'm happy to assist on providing a more in-depth demonstration of this if you wish. Um, that's for City Council or the general public. 
And then uh, after launch on April 23rd, uh, if you have a permit or you're needing a permit, feel free to create a public access account. Uh, it is free. There is no charge on your end other than paying your permit fees, but you can create the account as you wish. And then once again, if you do have an existing permit, license, or registration, um, if you do create the account and it's not in your account, please see us at the City Hall to be able to get that lined out. And that is the last slide, I believe. If you all have any questions, I'll take them now. Anyone like to start? Will I, you be able to pay other fees with this online, like a, a fire fee or something like that? Not currently. That is not in this current scope, but uh, that is one we have looked at. Um, B&O taxes as well will not be in this system because uh, CityWorks does not have a tax-based infrastructure that uh, met the necessary needs of finance, but finance has identified a system to supplement that and will be able to operate that. I don't know a timeline yet, but they have identified one. And currently our permit process is cumbersome. Um, are we streamlining that at all? Or are we just making it faster or are we actually streamlining? Like I know, for example, last summer we had some street vendors who wanted to be able to get their license, but all like their permit for that still had to go through engineering and all these all of these departments that didn't necessarily actually apply. So it we have standardized it for one. So departmental reviews still are a piece of it, but we provided the option for the department. If there is no need for them to uh, review this permit, it would be on them to waive the review of that permit and move it along. But as a citizen, you're not calling City Hall to find that out. You can see it from your account. You'll see the status and the stage that it is, what review it's sitting on, who to contact, and also more or less if there is an issue, you'll see why there's an issue. They'll have a comment from the staff at that stage of what, what they need to move it along. So the communication, in theory, <laughs> would streamline that process down to make it a little more seamless from having a question, getting it answered, and being able to process this permit. For our non-tech savvy residents, will they still be able to <coughs> come in? They will be able to come into City Hall as usual. Um, the paper-based format of this will change, um, but the idea is to make the electronic process of this as easy or easier than if you prefer paper, we'll still accommodate you, but uh, expect uh, changes because the paper forms we do have now don't quite match what we're changing to. So there will be a little bit of give and take in that process. question so during this whole review process every single um, permit type that went through got a re-review of you know the departments involved the questions asked so uh, the permit I'm typically familiar with is the special event permit and someone would be having a block party and it would be asking questions about parades or, or things like that and so those were some of the things trying to eliminate erroneous questions as um, uh, Mr. Davis mentioned before, but part of that review process before they ever got put into that system was looking at the questions asked and who was involved in that review process and making it so it may be that certain types of fences may require an engineering review, but other ones don't. And so they can look at that initial um, plan and essentially have the ability to say, I don't need to look at that anymore and then not be part of that. So hopefully that will streamline that process a little bit more. So is this a way of tracking the progress? Yes, is so that it tracks it that? on both sides. So it tracks it. Uh, <laughs> we get a lot of, well, I, I submitted this and I haven't gotten it, uh, or it's been in this department for X amount of days. And it may have been that, you know, it got turned back to the property owner for, you know, after a day or two. Uh, and, and there may have been a delay in getting that answer back for quite some time. But it does, it, it, it tracks when each of the steps is taken and something that i didn't mention in this i want to bring up as well this also has the ability to email applicants at certain stages when something is needed so an example like if there is another document that's needed or information needed um, there would be what's called a resubmission period where the staff would actually trigger 
uh, that something needs resubmitted and it will email the applicant letting them know, hey, you need to go to the public portal and figure out what's what you need to get changed. The same way as like when fees are due, it'll notify them when fees are due. It'll notify them when the placard's ready to go, so you get your building permit placard digitally that you can print off on your own or come it, down It to notifies them if they're registered, if they have a registered account, and that's the way they come into it? Um, You're requiring registration. Not necessarily. Um, the email notification is independent. It, it is aided by registering. If you register for an account with your email address, yes, it'll automatically add you to the account, but there is still an ability to do that um, without an account to be able to notify the applicant. What about want. online payment? Online payment will have to go through an account, but our finance department will still process payments on site. And this is a secure site in terms yes. of payment? Yes. There is a approved vendor that is 100% secure, operates many other marketable, marketable websites, so it is uh, an approved vendor and it is secure. And this is the one we used in the past that uh, you use your credit card, but there's an upcharge for using that? I uh, can't speak to that intelligently. I do believe there is a processing fee, but it may be on the city side, but I think the processing fee is minimal. It's Three percent, if I remember correctly. It, it's a different vendor than what we've used in the past for some of our uh, processing. So yes. it's the ones that integrate with CityWorks that, that we could select from. It, okay. it is a minimal fee, uh, percentage-wise. I think it's two to three percent, but don't don't hold me to those numbers. And in what instrument is required? Can this be done on your smartphone, or does it? Yes. Yes. The site is mobile friendly. It is able to be done entirely mobile based. However, if you wish to do it on a desktop, tablet, any size screen, it'll work. Is there, when, when somebody applies, is there an expected resolution date that they're going to get or? Um, are you speaking to like a level of service? Yeah. It, yeah. Um, or if like, say <clears throat> we get to this point in the process, is there any point in which something might be considered overdue? Um, maybe that could even be internal. Yeah, when it comes to overdue things, we do have uh, what are called dashboards, uh, kind of like what you saw on the screen, but internal that yeah. are, um, they're, we've been calling them buckets, basically when it's to a certain stage, it's sitting in this bucket, and that case will be there until the appropriate staff moves it ahead. And we'll see which staff on the workflow is needing to still review it, review or waive per se. But um, when it comes to like a level of service, that's one hope that everybody is getting out of this is that once we're comfortable with the system, we have an idea, an expectation of you get this certain permit, it takes us this long to move through it because uh, through a digital process, we can start to get those kind of metrics of how long it's taking staff to do a certain piece of the process. That's the other question I have for you is, so is there like easily exported reports from this that we can yes. get and see maybe where bottlenecks are or things like that? Yeah, there is a robust, I will say, a robust query system in this that a report can be built from. Uh, also GIS layers, which is uh, my win out of this is being able to get map layers out of it. Um, world is my oyster with that one but we also have the ability to uh, do just straight uh, spreadsheets if wished like we don't even have to go a actual report route we just need the query on whatever the question is and we can build it that's Great. one of the big wins that we have with this system is being able to easily access and query all this information we're collecting Great. and I'm sorry for my ignorance if in this question um, I know we talked a lot about event permits. This will also be like building permits and things <coughs> of that nature. I'm sorry. This will also include, would this also include building permits instead of just event? It's event permits, building, building okay. permits, planning and zoning permits. Every, um, everything we talked about was event wise. So then I was worried that maybe I had misinterpreted. That's no, the, uh, just for clarity. We're treating this like an event, I guess. <laughs> but um, the big thing is, um, yeah, event permits are one piece of it, but um, the primary build out of this has been the construction permits. Um, those are the most robust listing of the 
uh, permits that we have in this system. The other would be our planning and zoning. So anything that goes to the planning commission, board of zoning appeals, eventually city council, or uh, if it's a staff review kind of thing, those are also in the system. Um, and then the last group that came in were our business licenses, and those have been very positively received by finance. And then my last question, uh, will I be able to close out my open permits too then through this process? Like when I had a pergola built, I had to have it inspected and stuff like that. So the closeout duty will be on the city staff for that because they're the one performing the inspection. But when it comes to like getting your permit placard, you can get that electronically. It will be in your account on your case, so you'll have that available to you. Uh, you'll have the ability to uh, respond to comments to staff and be able to maybe answer the question like, when can I get this scheduled or when can I do this? But uh, the other benefit that is in the system that I won't dive too much into right now, but you'll be able to see the dates of when inspections are scheduled. Cool. So you'll be able to at least follow that along. But right now, I believe every case that we have in the system right now is uh, city staff requirement to close it out because it's dependent on an inspection mm -hmm. at this point. But the customer will have the ability to say, hey, I'm done, you can schedule the inspection now. Yes, okay. that is, the onus will still be on the applicant. Question, right? <laughs> Anybody else? Good. Well, thank you so much, I appreciate it. Look forward to showing you all more later. Thank you. Thank you, Marvin. Thanks. All right, up next, we have the Mon Valley Green Space Coalition presentation by Rick Landenberger. Did I say that right? You did. <coughs> Good to be here. Thanks for entertaining the Mon Valley Green Space Coalition and one of the ideas that we've been kicking around now for quite a long time. I'm Rick Landenberger. I live in Greenmont. I lived there for about 18, 19 years, and before that, I was in South Park. And I was a member of the first Green Space Coalition that started about 1995-96. And uh, just want to mention that this idea, the idea of Morgantown Greenbelt, is not a new idea. It's built on the shoulders of other folks who have done a lot of the legwork um, over the years to get it to where it is now. The second version of the Green Space Coalition is kind of in play now. It went um, like a lot of volunteer organizations that kind of took a hiatus when some of the people like Greg Good moved away and Greg's back and we're back and <laughs> things are happening again. Um, let me just say that I recognize most of us here, probably all of us here are fairly familiar with what a green belt is and what green space is. And I'm going to define some terms and um, talk about this, not from this standpoint of the Mon Valley Green Space Coalition, or I know all about this and I'm kind of educating you. That's not, that's not the approach here. The approach here is just to share the information that we've been gathering over the past couple of years, talk about the map that we've put together, and uh, try to generate some excitement and see what the next steps of the whole process might be. But one of my pet peeves is, is listening to somebody talk and they're talking down to you and telling you all about how this works and how that works, and, and that, I'm not doing that here. I just want to make that explicit. So what is a green belt? I bet all you guys could define a green belt. The green belt is a transportation system, a non-motorized or what's now being called an active transportation system that surrounds a community. A community can be an urban area like Morgantown or it can be a village or a town. If you go onto Google and you type in what is a green belt, you'll get four or five or six different definitions. But there are a few principles that you'll see associated with any of those definitions. One of the principles is that green belts and green spaces are relatively natural environments. They're parks. We all know what a park is, right? But at the same time, you think a little bit further, you probably recognize that parks have baseball fields and they have ice rinks and they have playgrounds and they also have natural areas like forests. So parks are this conglomeration of different what we call land uses, but green spaces kind of encompass that whole thing. They can be everything from a baseball field to an old growth forest and everything in between. They also are public. Green spaces and green belts are open to the public. That's a fundamental prerequisite to having a green space or a green belt. Another is that they're accessible to just about everybody. Hopefully, in theory, in perfection, they would be accessible to everybody. ADA folks that are challenged 
and uh, people like Ryan who run long distances every day. Another principle is that they're safe. People feel safe in them. People go there and, and they're able to, to put their worries behind them and relax and enjoy the natural system, enjoy the fresh air, enjoy the birds, enjoy whatever it is that they come there to experience. The one fundamental principle you're probably all wondering, what is, when is he going to say this? It's connectivity. Green belts connect neighborhoods to parks, neighborhoods to schools, neighborhoods to downtown, neighborhoods to any other feature of interest, down to the river, parks to parks, schools to schools. Connectivity is a fundamental component of a green belt. There are other principles that we could talk about some other time, but anyway, those are the three or four major ones that you should all know about, and I'm sure you probably already do. So what are the benefits of having a green belt in Morgantown? So we've talked about this for a long time and, and broken it down into two or three different kind of components of the benefits. One is the economic benefits associated with having a system like this, a transportation system that you and I can use on a daily basis, either walking or biking, that helps us get from our houses to work or our houses to our friends' houses or our houses to parks or our houses to schools. Um, and the economic benefits apply to all of those neighborhoods. All the neighborhoods increase in value because they're connected by these active transportation systems. This has been shown time and again for communities that have connectivity. It's an alternative to driving, right, besides that. There are also human benefits, health and wellness benefits. Walking is probably the best single exercise that humans could perform. And we all need places to do it. I live in Greenmont. I run around Greenmont. I've been running around South Park and Greenmont for a long time. Greenmont is a neighborhood without a park and without a trail. And I'm, for me, I'm fine running on the roads, but other people aren't. And the people that are a little bit worried about that need a good, safe trail to run on. So all of our communities ought to have trails that connect to a larger system of connected trails that act as an as a integrated, connected system, if you will. So there's the economic benefits that come with it. It draws tourists. It improves property values. It in, improves quality of life. It has all these things that are, I don't want to say fuzzy, but you all know what I'm talking about, and, and, other, and other places have experienced these economic benefits as well. Then there's the human health and wellness benefits associated with walking, associated with other activities, running on a rail trail, biking on a rail trail. These are all pretty well known, but um, have tremendous value. And you could even make the argument that human health and wellness benefits have economic benefits. You all look at your, your um, monthly uh, health insurance costs. What are they doing? They're going up. People need a, a place to safely exercise where they can reduce their diabetes and their asthma and their heart issues, et cetera. The third large group of benefits are what we call ecosystem services or environmental benefits. So green spaces and green belts perform a number of ecological functions. If they're forested, they scrub the air of pollutants. The air in Morgantown is questionable in quality. I've, I've lived here long enough. I've woken up every morning at 3.30 from the trucks that go through town. I've got soot all over my house from dirty diesel trucks. And one of the reasons that I'm not coughing right now is because I have a lot of trees in Green Mine. There's a lot of trees around that corridor, and those trees actually scrub the air. They collect all those PM10s and PM5s and PM2.5s that would normally get deep in your lungs, and they stick to the leaves, and the rain washes them off, and into the gutter they go, and downstream on Decker Street and down the Mon. But if those trees weren't there, if that green space wasn't there, if those green corridors that make up a green mill aren't, th aren't there, that air stays in the atmosphere and people breathe it in. So green spaces and green belts scrub the air. They also infiltrate water from stormwater's runoff. You get big storms here in Morgantown, and I have to tell you, you've seen the 
the effects of tremendous downpours here. There's flooding issues. There's tremendous gullying all around Morgantown, tremendous deep gullies where runoff could be mitigated by more green spaces, more parks, and a, and a functional green belt. Energy savings associated with parks. The neighborhoods that are near a large forested park have lower energy costs in the summertime for reasons that, if I quiz you, you could all, I'm sure, answer. Summers are warm, trees cool the environment, and if you are lucky enough to live in an area that has a lot of trees or next to a park, you could actually show the amount of energy required to cool your house as a function of distance from a park. There's a whole research domain about green spaces and parks, and this is one of the common studies that have been done all around the world, China, Europe, here in North America. The closer you are to a park, the lower your energy costs are. So those are the three biggies, economic, human health, and the ecosystem services. One of the ecosystem services that I'll finish with on this element here is nutrient cycling. What is nutrient cycling? Nutrient cycling is the ability of a natural ecosystem to take elements like sulfur, nitrogen, and increasingly in the news, carbon, CO2, out of the atmosphere and bind it up, at least temporarily, and then slowly release it so that the other organisms on this planet, including people, can use those elements. And it's a natural process. It's always been going on. It'll go on forever. And natural systems perform it. And it's worth millions and millions and millions of dollars on a landscape scale. Taking carbon, CO2 in particular, out of the atmosphere right now is, is what we need to do. It's 420-something parts per million. It needs to come down to 350 for a stable climate. We know this. Parks and green spaces and green belts will help us to do that. So that brings us to what are we going to do about the green belt? You all know that OEDC and WVU and the city have a big trail plan going on right now. You guys have seen some of the maps that they've rolled out. There's been a lot of planning over the past couple of years for trails and this idea that there should be a trail within, I don't know, 10 minutes or 15 minutes or something from everybody's house. Some of those trails are multiple use trails that would fit really well into a green belt and others are kind of specific use trails, like a downhill mountain bike course. A green belt, although could connect to a downhill mountain bike course or connect to some other special use type of trail, we're talking about multiple use routes here. So what we would suggest, what the Green Space Coalition would suggest is that the people who are doing the planning right now for all these other very important trails get together and start thinking about connectivity, building on the existing system, and then prioritizing where the gaps are. So if you look at that map, you'll see everybody's been up and down the Mon River Rail Trail. Everybody's been up and down Decker's Creek, I'm sure. We have the basic infrastructure there. The idea now will be to prioritize where the links need to be built so that this system functions like a belt, so that you could actually ride around Morgantown without crossing major highways or you know, putting your safety at risk by riding on a road or running on a road or walking on a road. And a lot of this work has been done by the MMMPO. You guys have seen their pedestrian plans. They've done a fantastic job. They helped us. They put this map together. So the basic components are in place. All we really need to do is people get together, sit down, and, and try to prioritize where those links need to be built. And this is not a heavy lift. This is a kind of thing that many cities have already done. And the cities that have done it have benefited tremendously. And you can, you, know, you can go online and find out what cities have green belts and what the benefits of the green belts are. But our point is that we've done a lot of work in the past. The rail trails are fantastic. There are trails being built right now, not just by OEDC in the city, but by the Mon Valley Green Space Coalition. We're building a connector trail. Dave knows about it. Other people know about it. We need to do more of that, and we need to sit down and basically find the money and find the land to fill this thing out. That's the argument, and there's a group of people that are willing to, to commit time and energy and experience to making that happen, and it's just a matter of kind of figuring out how we can do that as a, as a city, as a group of, of partners.
to collaborate so that our trails are high quality, sustainable, and available to everybody. And that's the argument here. So if that appeals to you and there's something in that that you think you can grab onto and run with, and I'm really glad to see that the city is taking that step coming up here with the earmarks, fantastic. That's a great thing to do, good for you guys. Anything that we can do to help you with that, we're here to, to, to help and to make it happen. Because I want to stay in Morgantown. I have options. I could go to Greece or some other place. I'm going to stay here, and, and uh, I want to make it a better city. And so do the people in the Green Space Coalition. So that's, that's the argument there. I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. Well, thank you. Questions? That's what I was going to ask. Um, just... Thank you very much for sure. your, your presentation. For I, I truly hope that's uh, given us something truly worth aspiring to. And certainly, uh, it's the kind of thinking that we'd like to have. We do appreciate you doing it, and yeah. bringing it forth. We appreciate you showing up at our meetings. Bill is one of these guys who, Dave, you're welcome. All you guys are welcome. To, we meet once a month, second Wednesday, 6 o'clock. We do it by Zoom. And we just talk about this stuff, what we're going to be working on, and you know, where the money is. And we would love to bump up our game actually even more and build more trails and work more closely with the city and OEDC. So. Rick, thank the, you for, for your sure. work on that. Um, is, is what is needed some land acquisition as well to make this connection? Like how much? Private yeah. land? Are we looking at maybe? It's an obvious question, and I've been told actually, to, don't go there. You know? But um, yeah, it, in some cases, there are private chunks that would make a great place to make the connection. Sure, there's no question that the city doesn't own all the potential places, but there are <coughs> what I call low-hanging fruit, where the city already owns the land or there's a willing donor of a piece of property and we should go after those first and what I would say is mm -hmm. places like Hirschman Park everybody knows where Hirschman Park is I'm not, not sure that they do probably not <laughs> okay it's below White Avenue yeah. between Marilla Park on the east and Greenmont on the west it's basically that section of White Avenue that drops off into what used to be Decker's Creek Decker's Creek used to flow at the bottom of that hill right there before they put the gap in the hogback turn and moved it over. That was where Decker's Creek used to flow. Anyway, above that old floodplain is a seven acre parcel that is, in my opinion as an ecologist, the best example of old growth forest in Morgantown. Every bit as good as what's over in the Arboretum, which is very good, by the way. But it's really nice. It hasn't been long. It's full of wildflowers. It's full of wildlife. It's got giant trees on it. And it's steep. But it's not impossible to put a trail through there. And you could then link Greenmont to Marilla by cooperating with Adelaide, who's been very receptive to this idea, going across the city and then coming out on Gifford, on a paper street at Gifford. I mean, there's low-hanging fruit, is my point. To, and I would actually get a list together of those low-hanging fruit components and work on those while we're thinking about the more difficult challenges. I mean, we're all capable of thinking about many things simultaneously, right? It's multitasking. We should be multitasking on this. And the, the priority trails that we should be going after first should be win-wins in the sense that even if the green belt doesn't ever happen, and it will, but let's say in the worst case scenario it doesn't happen, those trails that we're building now have standalone value. It's not, they're not dependent completely on having this thing all fleshed out. They're necessary now, like connecting my house to Marilla, so I don't have to run on White Avenue. Sounds very self-serving, I know that, but it's a joke. It's a, a lot of people go along White Avenue right now, they, and the, the traffic on White Avenue is terrible. It's gotten really bad, really bad. I used to never see people on that road. Now, I always have to get off the side of the road and let people pass. Well, Brockway's so awful. Yeah, yeah, that whole area down there is a disaster. Have to go that way instead it's of going It's a there. disaster. Have you spoken with the Land Reuse and Preservation Agency? Yes, many times. Great. Yep, Brent Bailey is my boss for the Land Trust. He's a member of that group. Mm -hmm. We're going to present to them next month. Great. Yeah. 
So that's another piece that's in that's already there. You guys were forward thinking enough to get those They're guys kind of together. the long term vision we need to yeah, be working on. Yeah, this good for arm. you. That's what we need. We need a, an organization like that in place. You mm -hmm. might also want to have a policy on to avoid getting green what do you call that when somebody holds a piece of property hostage, jacks the price up, you know what I'm talking about. Don't pay more than fair market value. Get an appraisal and say, we pay fair market value. That's our <clears> policy. <throat> and that will help you to deal with some of those issues. There's other ways around. There's lots of tools that you could use to get a trail on a piece of private property. There's rights away agreements. There's leases. There's deed documents. There's conservation easements. There's acquisition. There's all these <clears throat> tools that people like Brent know all about that you could use. For each situation. I think I would hope that perhaps your next step, and I hate to give you work to do, but uh, you can help identify what you call the low hanging fruit. Yeah, sure. And uh, things that may be achievable and beginning, make a beginning, I guess. It's really. Yeah, yeah. no, it's the, it's the smart I, thing to do. Truth of the matter is, you have a very good beginning. What you now need to do is just right. start the process. We need to get a few more kind of successes under our belt and generate more interest and get some momentum and all those buzzwords that you hear about. Yeah, when we're thinking about that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> Next, ah. we have the Your Community Foundation of North Central West Virginia. Activities update from one Patty Showers Ryan, the president, and Lori, oh no, a build so. Did I say that right? Oh, thank you. Vice president. Thank you very much. I was like, is Lori here? But she's hiding behind the pole. <laughs> Hello, council members, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. My name is uh, Patty Showers Ryan. I'm the president of your Community Foundation of North Central West Virginia. Very long name, so we call ourselves YCF. I'm also here this evening with our vice president, Laria Biltso. And we're here tonight just to give you an update on YCF, some of the <coughs> things we've been working on over the past, past year and a half. I just handed out to you our um, 2022 annual report. We're working on our 2023 one right now, but a lot of, a lot of great accomplishments, and we just want to provide you with an update. So YCF's mission, in case um, some of you aren't familiar with us, is to promote philanthropy and build endowment funds that benefit our community. We were formed in 2011 with the merger of two different nonprofits, and we serve a five county region, and that includes Harrison, Marion, Mon, Preston, and Taylor counties. YCF is a tax exempt public charity, and we help enable residents with philanthropic interests support local issues easily and effectively that they care about. YCF is currently managing an asset pool of nearly $24 million and that consists of 170 diverse funds. Those funds make annual distributions of grants and scholarships every year. So a little bit about YCF in 2023, last year. In 2023, YCF awarded more than $600,000 in grants and scholarships. This included uh, a new pilot educator mini grant program that we initiated last year for YCF. We were able to make 39 educator uh, grants across our five county region for a total of $25,000. Each educator could request up to $750. And we received requests for a variety of needs from things like basic classroom materials and such as like whiteboards and seating to STEM projects, to gardening and sports equipment for classrooms. In 2023, YCF also received over $3 million in donations, and this helped create six new funds. Two of these new funds were from estate gifts. We often, um, individuals can leave YC a gift to YCF in their will. And these two estate gifts, um, we're happy to say, will be supporting the future animals and the arts. 
Also in 2023, YCF saw their investments grow by nearly almost 17%. So in 2024, fast forward to this year, we're currently overseeing our annual scholarship program. Thanks to a lot of really generous donors, YCF is able to make uh, 40 different scholarship opportunities available to the residents in our community. Our applications were due online on March 5th, and we have um, more than 120 volunteers in our five county region that volunteer and take time to read those applications. We receive hundreds of applications. So we're very grateful for, her, for the donors and the volunteers that help us. We announced those scholarship recipients in May. YCF will once again um, offer a community grant application that becomes available online in July, and we have a due date that's in September. We have an awards recognition that's planned for recipients in November. So with that, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Laurie, and she's gonna talk with you about our organizational arts grants. Thank you, Patty. Good evening, and um, thank you for this opportunity to provide you all with an update on the organizational arts grant program. Um, for those who are unfamiliar, the mission of the program is to broaden the base supports of the arts, to promote excellence in the arts, and ensure that arts and cultural organizations provide a variety of programs for our community. And in this case, the community includes all of Mon County, including the city of Morgantown. And so this program is a collaboration between YCF and the Arts Council of Greater Morgantown with funding from the City of Morgantown, the Monongalia <coughs> County Commission, and the Douglas H. Tanner Memorial Fund for the Arts, which is managed by YCF. Um, funds from other sources may also be granted through this process, and I'm pleased to report that we have um, received donations from individuals toward this grant program. And so to be considered, an organization um, just needs to be a 501c3 nonprofit operating in um, Mon County. And um, they must have an organizational mission statement that promotes or serves the arts. Or if they don't have that type of mission, they can do a project that promotes or serves the arts. Um, so the full details are available on our website. And in your packet, we have the link. Um, that is where you can also find the timeline. So we do this grant process annually. Uh, we open that grant application typically in mid-April. It's due in early June. And then we have a committee of volunteers. I know Patty mentioned we have 120 volunteers that look at scholarship applications. We also have a community grants uh, committee and a committee specific to this organizational arts grant process. They review those applications and make recommendations for awards. Um, that happens in July. And then um, those final grant awards are approved by the boards, uh, the boards of both the Arts Council and YCF. And then those award checks are presented at an annual event in early, um, in early August. And I know some of you have attended those in the past. Um, so as far as the um, history of this grant making process, it started as a collaboration in 2018. And since then, over $1 million has been awarded to community nonprofits. Um, so just last year in the most recent grant cycle, um, $142,320 was awarded to nine local arts and cultural organizations. And so what you have in your packet, um, it starts I believe on page four, is a brief summary of the impacts of the grants that were awarded in 2022. So at the conclusion of each grant cycle, we ask for um, a final report so that we can you know, assess the impact of, of those dollars. And so in 2022, 14 organizations received grants. And I'm not going to go through and read each of those. You have those in your packet. But I, do, I just want to point out some of the highlights and the trends that we noticed. Um, so first off, the grant supported a wide variety of arts and cultural offerings, and that included live music, um, painting and crafting, the support of a couple of public murals, dance performances, live theater, sculptural art, a printmaking exhibit, and an art market. And so these grants included support for the enjoyment of the arts across age groups, um, so while there were offerings for all ages, many of these focused particularly on children. And so we have several organizations that either offer classes or opportunities for um, students to participate 
in the arts, in dance, in musical theater. Um, we had the West Virginia Public Theater have a performance of Schoolhouse Rock specifically for school age children. And over 900 Montgomery County students attended those school matinees. So those are just some examples. Um, some of the common themes that we noticed across these reports is increased participation. And so that was in the form of higher ticket sales, increased attendance at classes, um, new audiences being reached, and a stronger sense of community engagement. Um, and as you all know, the pandemic um, had a huge impact on the arts. Many of these organizations had to shut down their operations. And you know, what we can see from these reports is that um, it looks as though most have recovered and audiences are hungry for these types of opportunities. So um, I just want to thank you all for supporting the arts in our community. Um, and I, um, in closing, I just want to share a quote from the grant committee chair, um, Lisa Giuliani. And she shared, um, thanks to a variety of local nonprofits dedicated to the arts, we have a community that is filled with opportunity for both the visual and performing arts. The donated funds help our local arts organizations provide family-friendly cultural art experiences for Morgantown and Monongalia County. Our residents have a lot to be proud of when it comes to our community's support for the arts. So this is just another piece of you know, the quality of life. You know, this ties into what Rick was talking about with quality of life, with um, you know, active transportation. It's just another, um, a, a, just another benefit to residents of this community. So thank you all. Um, and at this time, I'm going to pass it back over to Patty to wrap things up. Just one final update um, for our council members that I want to make sure that you, you're probably aware that we're working to wrap up a $1 million match campaign. So a quick update about that. Um, we received a, a $1 million challenge um, opportunity from an anonymous donor. The anonymous donor's goal was to help YCF build a pool of unrestricted grant-making funds. And while YCF does manage, you heard a large pool of endowment funds, uh, nearly all of them are restricted. Each of the 170 different funds that we manage has a fund agreement that's signed by a donor with restrictions on how those funds can be used. And we categorize those um, seven into seven different areas, and that includes animal welfare, arts and culture, community development and support, education, health and social services, sports and recreation, and scholarships. So the anonymous donor challenged YCF to raise $900,000 in what we call impact funds. The dollars raised for this part of the campaign are unrestricted and will be used for the greatest needs of the community as they change over time. The funds are placed into an endowment and only the annual earnings are used to make a grant distribution to benefit our community forever. So in 2023, with the help of many generous donors, YCF was able to reach and exceed the $900,000 goal. All the donations have been matched 100% by that anonymous donor. Any community members are welcome to continue to add to the impact fund and YCF accepts donations. We, we've seen donations come from individuals, businesses, foundations, and estate gifts. And then we provide the donation receipt. And so we just try to remind our community that the larger this pool is, and that we, if we invest together, the greater the returns are and the distributions are back to our community forever. The second part of this campaign, so that was the $900,000 piece that we were able to achieve. The other $100,000 was to create a fund called the Addiction Prevention Initiative Fund. And this is a fund that is um, going to support programs that are, are geared to lessen and alter the destructive impact of alcohol and drug addiction on children and their families. So YCF has received donations of more than $40,000 towards this endowment, and we're currently working to raise an additional $55,000 to receive the match so that we can complete the 100, we want to receive the 100% match from the anonymous donor, so we the $100,000 to create this new fund, because we think this is really important for our community as well. So we're making a lot of success with that campaign. We're continuing our grant making and, and providing the scholarships for the community and um, just real positive um, with donations and new funds being created. So we appreciate the support of our Morgantown City Council members and we're happy to take any questions or comments. Uh, what was the name of that new fund you said you're establishing? 
the Addiction Prevention Initiative Fund. Okay. And it's an endowment fund. And it's not yet established. Just, right, we're working on that right okay. now. And then once it, when donors make a gift, we do have to let them sit and earn, have earnings for at least four quarters a year, and then we can begin making distributions. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> I do wanna say first, thank you for coming in and presenting to us today. I know that when we do the school awards, when it comes to scholarships, you all come up quite a bit. So I can say from on behalf of the students, I'm sure. Thank you very much. I've seen a lot of the scholarship essays the kids have been asking me proofread for them that they've been submitting to you. Well, thank you for proofreading them. That's a lot of work, too. <laughs> no, we appreciate it. I mean, we're able to do that because we have generous people in this community that have donated those funds. You know, we're really providing kind of the back office support so that they can be philanthropists in the community. Thank you for contributing to. We all do such a great job. Thank you. There's no one else? No. Thank right. you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you so Patty. much. All right. And that, oh, wait, no, I lied. Next part. Uh, up next, we have our strategic plan review final report. <clears throat> I turn the floor over to Ms. Mazzarelli. I am trying to find the... Okay, uh, I promised I would be brief. Um, so, uh, as many of you know, we had the uh, strategic plan um, uh, that we started in 2020. Uh, we last week uh, you all got the final report uh, which will be available on our website if it is not already it has lots of details in it about every single action step that was given and the report on that um, and I just wanted to give a brief uh, presentation about um, the highlights of that so uh, just a quick reminder um, what is a strategic plan uh, we have lots of plans in local government we have uh, plans for comprehensive plans when it comes to planning and zoning. We have our uh, five-year capital improvement plan. Uh, we've got one-year plans that are more of our, our general fund budgets, and then we have strategic plans. Uh, they're intended to kind of set the, the direction for the city and things for us to focus on. This particular plan uh, was developed uh, about halfway through 2020. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers 2020. It was a rough year. Um, so we had a lot going on. Uh, when a city council uh, sat down to do this, we were uh, anticipating a new city manager, uh, still kind of in the midst of COVID and not entirely sure what that was going to mean as a community, um, uh, struggling with uh, nationwide uh, movements and just really kind of unsure. So um, we had a consultant that was able to help us with that initial uh, development of the plan. Out of that, uh, council identified 10 goals. Um, and so I'll kind of briefly touch on each of these and then um, what the, the key um, factors are. Um, so our first one was attractive amenities. We wanted to uh, explore new and enhanced amenities that focus on riverfront advantage, arts and culture, family-friendly recreation, and preserving green spaces. We had a presentation today to talk about some of the efforts that we've already done, but wanted to just kind of highlight uh, some of the things. Again, each one of these uh, goals had uh, anywhere between three and five priorities that were listed. And then each of those priorities had about three to five uh, action steps for each of those priorities. So lots of uh, action steps. We've just taken a couple out of here, uh, highlighting uh, the uh, new Morgantown Adventure Outfitters that operates down at the wharf uh, for <coughs> kayak rentals, bicycle rentals. I know many of you have had the opportunity to go on that. Uh, I have as well, uh, which has been great. Um, we have been working closely with Bow Park about uh, pump tracks uh, um, at some of their facilities as well. So really kind of adding new or enhanced recreation that we did not have before. Uh, and then we have just been able to replace the Woodburn Community Playground. So those playgrounds that are accessible to different communities, um, that was a, a project where there was a um, questionable playground there for many years. I, I happened there once and went up in an old wooden structure and was afraid that uh, it wasn't going to quite hold me until I got back down. But we now have a new structure there. 
Um, so these are just a couple of the attractive amenities that we've been able to add in the last couple of years. Um, when I started at the city, everyone had um, uh, talked about just really bad relationships we had with uh, different community groups. And, you know, we have put a lot of effort into making sure that we um, improve those relationships, even just us being here in the county commission chambers for the last uh, almost two years. <laughs> you know, really shows how far we've been able to go. So uh, the goal with this was really to improve our overall community's health, well-being, and safety uh, through sustained collaborative relationships with public, nonprofit, and private sector. We also heard from YCF uh, from the nonprofit sector. So uh, we were able to, in the last couple of years, create the uh, Citizens Academy. This is our third cohort. You'll actually be hearing from them later this month about their opportunity and again I know a couple of you had had the opportunity to attend some of those um, really helping create more engaged citizens I ran into someone who was uh, on I believe the second cohort who now serves on the uh, Bull Park Foundation so it's great to kind of see these people getting uh, very quickly involved with local government uh, we also work very closely with Hazel's House and the groups that are uh, up there and then uh, we have been working really closely with the Mon County Development Authority, both on the runway extension, the Richwood Project, I-68 Commerce Park. So these are really potential large developments that we are leveraging our community partners to work with. Um, excellent equitable city services. Uh, again, this was a time where we wanted to uh, really emphasize being equitable. Uh, we wanted to focus on uh, operating efficiently, consistently, and transparently to continue to improve uh, our response to our community needs. So we have done a whole lot. You also heard from Marvin today um, about the, uh, imp the work that we've done on CityWorks, which isn't really intended to uh, kind of, I always say, bring us to, <laughs> to the century. Um, most people don't want a handwritten uh, paper form submitted to them, both the per person filling it out and the person trying to read somebody else's handwriting so we're trying to move that forward a little bit uh, we've done uh, major uh, improvements within our um, fire department uh, we have a brand new ladder truck uh, that is getting the final equipment upgrades uh, we will have the opportunity the community will have the opportunity to uh, see that up close and personal in a couple of weeks uh, so hopefully we'll be uh, showing that new event, uh, truck off at a, an event to be announced soon. Uh, we also have, were able to remodel the Norwood Fire Station, so had some major issues. Um, I know the chief was here a couple months ago talking about some of those issues, and we're working to address other facilities as well. And then we've been continuing to, uh, I always say we're, we're kind of like a ever-evolving uh, uh, blob shape that, um, you know, uh, when we lose staff, sometimes we're reorganizing duties, but uh, continuing to kind of evolve uh, how, however best we can serve the public. Transportation and infrastructure. Um, this is something uh, that I feel very strongly about. We heard from uh, the Green Space Coalition, we need to put a focus on accessible and active transportation, uh, utilizing partnerships. So we have, uh, through working with council, been able to set aside um, over a, mil a million dollars in sidewalk improvement funds, which will be uh, going in construction this, uh, this calendar year. We also have been able to uh, make some new and enhanced bus shelters. Uh, in the last couple years, since 2020, we coordinated with the Division of Highways where we actually now perform snow removal on a number of state-owned uh, roadways. We're, we're driving over these anyway. We have the equipment and can get to them a lot quicker. So that's something to better serve our residents where we have that uh, contract with the state. Um, we've been able to do uh, a number of streetscapes, some of them in the downtown with uh, another one on Walnut Street hopefully being uh, put out to bid here in another month or two. So being able to con continue to see those improvements um, and then we're working uh, with MUB to, uh, on, for an infrastructure project, uh, working on the drainage in the Popano Run area to hopefully address some of the flooding uh, that occurs further downstream. Uh, fiscal stability uh, was uh, something that was really a focus. Um, there have been a lot of funds out here, but uh, rewind back to about March of 2020, and um, we had a about a million dollars in our financial stabilization fund and now we have 
uh, over six and a half million dollars in our financial stabilization fund. Um, we've been able to uh, replace outdated software with things that um, you know cost less money or can allow us to do our jobs more efficiently, saving money. And then uh, we've been uh, one of the things in fiscal stability was trying to continue to grow and annex. We have been able to successfully annex two properties uh, since the, the state made some of the changes to their annexation laws with a third one on their way. So um, it is something that we, we continue to do within the, the limits of what we're able to. Um, vibrant downtown, you know, we all will say that we're still struggling with certain elements of our downtown, but if anyone has been at any of the events in, over the last couple of years in the downtown, there are a lot of people coming out to the events. There's a lot of activity, a lot uh, buzzing. So we wanted to make sure that we had um, a safe, welcoming, lively downtown, uh, different types of experience. And so uh, since 2020, we have put in a number of large murals, uh, both on you know sides of buildings uh, and then on the utility boxes. Uh, we've been working with Main Street Morgantown on the Morgantown Restore project to put things into the vacant uh, storefronts and then have held uh, a number of events, um, Hops on the Mon, Moonlit Market, the Christmas Tree event, um, all the arts walks. I know First Fridays is uh, going on now, uh, and uh, I think this is announced. I don't think this is uh, breaking anything, but the Great Race will also be uh, in the downtown this summer. So these are all things... Uh, a couple of those are, are events that we've had before, but some of these are, are new events that have never been downtown before, and so it's really exciting to kind of see them uh, come to life. Uh, strong neighborhoods. Uh, I believe since 2020, we have installed six neighborhood signs. Uh, some of those were replacing existing ones or replaced or in the process of replacing. So these are signs that their neighborhoods feel very strongly about. They take a lot of pride in. So being able to... Um, uh, put those back into place if they were uh, damaged or, or disappeared, um, or being able to have ones that uh, just never existed before. But um, we've been able to uh, make some improvements that have been brought upon by council members, whether that's um, really going after condemned properties or creating connector trails. Um, so it's just been really exciting to kind of see those uh, be able to enhance our, our neighborhoods. Uh, arts and culture, uh, we've, I believe this has been a huge focus and we've made really great strides. Um, I think I've seen every single one of you at a summer concert series. It's something we're very proud of. Um, but also just the, uh, the working with City and Bill Park. There's a number of galleries um, that Bill Park does at the Wilds Hill Center. There's art uh, exhibits at the airport that didn't exist before. Um, we have a, um, a new director, a museum manager. So since this time, we had actually, uh, the museum used to be, I don't want to necessarily say operated by Bull Park, but it was kind of, Bull Park was the pass-through agency, and they kind of operated pretty independently. Uh, we've taken that back under um, city control and worked a lot more closely with them and been able to provide resources, and uh, they've been already uh, really excited about what they've been able to do uh, and what they plan to do in the future. So uh, we also created the Cultural Arts Commission, um, and they provide advice and, and kind of direction on, on a number of things. Um, we've also, uh, to enhance our welcoming and inclusive community, um, we have been trying to uh, welcome people with diverse backgrounds to participate in city life. We talked a little bit about the Citizens Academy, um, the ambassadors. Uh, since its inception, uh, they have been the smiling faces walking around downtown uh, telling you anything you'd like to know. Uh, we actually, last year, they've been here, uh, but they have been doing tours, so really kind of getting that, you know, welcoming individuals to the community. Um, we have also been trying to uh, create a more inclusive community uh, with both the Minority Liaisons Coordinating Council, which I know I worked uh, with a number of folks in the community on, uh, are working with our Human Rights Commission on their initiatives, our Civilian Police Review and Advisory Board. Uh, so, and then obviously the branding, trying to um, kind of brighten up our, our brand and, and modernize it and really kind of uh, get out there and in, in including the community. Um, I think this is the last of the 10 is emergency planning and resilience. So again, you know, 
I don't know if anyone was fully prepared for a global pandemic and, and kind of shifting to that. So, you know, one part of that is financial. And then the other part is, you know, how prepared are we as a community to respond? So this was a focus that we wanted to do to make sure that, you know, we could be prepared and respond to uh, events that are happening. Um, unfortunately, before this meeting, we were talking about the tragedy uh, that happened to the Key Bridge in Baltimore. Um, as a community, we have to be able to be prepared for the unthinkable, um, the the unforeseen, and, and be able to act quickly and respond. Um, through that, we have been working to uh, really shore up our facilities. This is the core of how we provide our services. Um, everything from repairing our facilities, repairing our IT infrastructure, uh, having uh, an ability to become more mobile, um, and uh, putting you know generators into our buildings, many of those things, so we can uh, be a little bit more responsive. Um, so we've created a thinking fund for our facilities um, to address things that come up. Uh, many of our facilities are very old. Um, we updated our crisis communication plan. Uh, we've been installing a number of cameras uh, in the downtown wharf area. Uh, this lets us see uh, some of the things going on uh, in the downtown in real time. Uh, and then we've been participating at a larger scale, uh, both um, with you know police, fire, uh, EMS. The picture here is actually when they did uh, kind of a large-scale emergency response uh, training at the airport. So, you know, how do we respond to active shooter drills? How do we respond to mass casualty events? Um, how COVID uh, kind of launched us into even just doing kind of larger-scale community information. Uh, we have the, the we had the Joint Information Committee or the JIC uh, that the health department kind of took the lead in, but we all needed to play our part in kind of getting information out. So. Um, as I said, there was a lot of specific action steps, 143 of them to be exact, uh, that are all highlighted in this. And um, it was really exciting to go through. And actually, we had the initial one. We provided an interim report. I believe it was it, towards the end of 2021. And at the end of 2023, starting 2024, when we we're prepping for our next one, we went through and said, OK, what have we really done? Um, it's conveniently color-coded, but we have completed 74 percent of the 143 things that are in this document with almost every single other thing in process there are a couple that i will say nothing got moved on but it's very very minimal how many things have not made any progress so um i remember when we <coughs> did this and i'm thinking holy cow how are we supposed to do all of this um, but it is through the efforts of every single staff member, the efforts of city council, the community, because a lot of this takes volunteer effort. Um, just everything that has been accomplished is just really exciting. Um, and we're about to start all over again. Uh, so in about two and a half weeks, uh, we will be having our next strategic planning uh, retreat session, whatever you want to call it, a two-day session. It is open to the public, um, where we will be talking about you know what's working well in our community what we need to focus on and kind of uh restating or <coughs> resetting or recalibrating what those goals are and um in three or four years we'll be here telling you uh, how much we got accomplished so again thank you so much uh, if you have questions happy to answer them um yeah and i think you guys all i was told you got this in your packet last mm -hmm. week but we do have extras here uh if anyone wants them and that probably wasn't <coughs> uh, didn't pay attention. Anybody have anything? Thank you. Go through all that. That was a lot. A lot of info. It's nice to have the checklist. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. Nice. Yeah, I'm doing I'm checking my stuff. Yeah, the updates on them is nice to see where where we're done, where we're moving, and you said the seventy four percent, that's pretty it's impressive. Okay. All right. Thank you. Close this portion. Where'd my notes go? Hold on. This looks terrible on camera. There we go. We're going to close uh, the portion of presentations, and now we move on to the public portion. Uh, if anybody wishes to speak, I'll open that now. The public all left. <laughs> 
I love this. <laughs> you want to speak back here? No. Twice. <laughs> All right. Now we have our items for discussion. An ordinance amending the zoning code to establish a use classification for smoke shop or tobacco store, establish definitions related to the use, and provide for permitted use and supplemental conditions related to the use and related defined terms. And who do I turn to? Uh, Deputy Mayor, I'd be happy to describe the content of this ordinance. This is a proposed amendment to the zoning code to specify a new use designated a uh, smoke shop or tobacco store. Uh, the uh, the basic provisions of this ordinance are modeled on uh, ordinances that other West Virginia communities have enacted, including the city of Charleston, the city of Huntington, and Fayette County. Um, this is a use type that is not specifically defined in Morgantown's code currently, uh, so it, it leaves the development services staff with a decision to classify these as retail uses or convenience store uses <coughs> that do not really encompass the the primary purpose of the business being operated at these establishments. Uh, so this will update and specify what those uses are, and like with other uses in the code, we'll classify it among the districts in the city, uh, permitting it in certain zones and establishing supplemental conditions for locations where these uses are established. This ordinance uh, would permit the smoke shop or tobacco store use as a permitted use in the B2 service business district and as a conditional use in the uh, B5 shopping center district. There's a supplemental <coughs> condition attached to the use that uh, specifies these types of uses will be separated 1,500 feet from one another as well as from schools and daycares. Uh, that's the uh, essentially the same provision as contained in both the Charleston and the Huntington ordinances. It's a, a less restrictive provision than is in the, uh, the Fayette County ordinance. The definition of the use uh, specifies that this is not a use classification that will be applied to stores that incidentally sell tobacco products, so it doesn't apply to grocery stores or uh, convenience stores or drug stores that have as their uh, main business the sales of multiple types of goods to the public and, and incidentally these uses. Uh, the recommendation is to forward this ordinance to the Planning Commission for review and advice to Council on consistency with the comprehensive plan uh, so that Council could take this up on a regular meeting after the Planning Commission is able to do that. All right. Uh, I guess first, do we have any questions in regards to the ordinance? And I, I believe you mentioned B2 is permitted, B5 conditional, but it's the other way around. B2 is conditional, B5 is permitted. I apologize. I transposed this. Okay. Thank you for yep. correcting that. Okay. All right, then are we okay with moving this to the commission? Um, I had a question. Um, let me pull it back up here. Um, So it doesn't, <coughs> so have we defined a, like a smoke shop, tobacco shop before, or is this exclusive to like vape shops? We the city of Morgantown has not defined uh, these before, or at least they're not currently defined in the code. I, I don't know if they may have been defined under prior zoning ordinances. Okay. Um, and it's saying every smoke shop store shall conform with all federal, state, and local laws and regulations related to sale of electronic smoking devices. Um, every vape shop is violating fe federal law right now, to my understanding, um, with the sale of flavored vapes. So does this affect that at all? <laughs> um, I, that is a condition stated in the ordinance. Obviously, it's an implicit condition already being federal law. Yeah. I, I think um, those those regulations are are complicated, at least to me. But I, I mean, I think that's that's generally the case, as I understand it, that the the FDA prohibits the sales of uh, of flavored liquid cartridges for uh, for vaping. Um, the I mean, the the actual zoning classification of the use doesn't uh, doesn't necessarily provide. Uh, provide more enforcement of that. I think it, it mainly is enforced through the FDA with the assistance of local law enforcement, but um, you know, the, the city would have a better record of where these operations are located, if nothing else. Okay. 
Thank you. No more questions? All right. Uh, move to the commission by acclamation. Sure. Yes. yes. All right. Then that's it for items of discussion. Uh, and that <coughs> now, all right, hold on. Move to adjourn. <laughs> Second. <laughs> All right. Well, we stayed adjourned. Notice I moved up. <laughs> that concludes our my, our committee of the whole. Thank you, everybody, for watching.